Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the afternoon session on Friday. Um, we have three speakers this afternoon and the first speaker is Jay Gambetta from IBM. And um, maybe Jay can already start uh, sharing his slides and turn on the video while I'll talk a little bit more. Um, one brief announcement um, is that there's another opportunity um, to have your digital group um, uh, to take a, to participate in a digital group picture this afternoon at quarter to six. So if you haven't been in one, please um, go there. Another announcement related to uh, Jay's talk is that um, unlike some of the other talks, um, the round table is not right after his talk, but at six o'clock. Uh, so keep an eye on that, uh, that you, if you wanna talk more to Jay, you can uh, join that round table. And um, so let's now talk about um, uh, what we're going to hear in the next hour, uh, which is Jake and Beda talking about challenges and directions of quantum computing technology. Jay is giving an invited uh, talk at this year's KRP. We'll be very happy for him to be present here, uh, although virtually. Um, as many of you may know, Jay is IBM Fellow and Vice President of Research at IBM. And um, he has a long history in quantum computing. He had uh, he did postdocs at uh, Yale and Waterloo on uh, superconducting qubits, and then in 2011 he joined IBM, and um, that was a, a big moment in the sense that um, uh, basically I could say that that was the start of uh, IBM expanding its effort on quantum technology and Jay leading the way in many ways. Um, uh, one uh, clear uh, leadership uh, of his is the um, you know, bringing uh, quantum computers to the public via the uh, IBM quantum experience that many of you are familiar with. And he's always been a theorist working very closely with experiment list and uh, I think very exceptional in this way. Um, well, without further ado, I'm happy to uh, leave the floor to Jay. Uh, take it away. Thanks, Barbara, and thanks everyone for inviting me. Um, I will uh, give you a, a bit of a talk about what, um, where I see some of this technology going, what we're doing, and um, we'll see where we get. So, um, I, I start with this picture, not because uh, it's uh, it looks nice. I do like the picture of it, but it's just to highlight that I think we, what we're going with the hardware is a transition from uh, doing lab demonstrations to building systems. Um, I hear many people say quantum computing is like transitioning from science to engineering. I strongly disagree with that because I think there's so much science to be done, but there is definitely a shift. There's a shift to us wanting to put things together in more of a systematic way. And so with that sort of perspective is how I'll present how we're going forward and doing some of our hardware and some of the things that we're going beyond that. So just to go back, um, as Barbara said, uh, in, in 2011, this was one of our 2010 devices right when I was uh, joining IBM. Um, basically, it was two qubit experiments. Here they are capacitively shunted flux qubits, uh, which are shown with the qubit Q1 and Q2. And you see um, down the bottom is the packaging that was inside it. And at this time, we did this uh, with Jerry Chow. Um, we did this uh, experiment that was really, really, really hard back then, but it was simply to demonstrate a two qubit gate. And it was a two qubit gate with about uh, almost 20% uh, uh, error. And if I go forward now to, that, to today, this is one of our latest uh, systems uh, that we have online. Um, this, we call it the Hummingbird uh, quantum processor. It's a 65 uh, qubit machine. And what you can see here is the error rates in these larger systems have gone down quite a lot, uh, down, uh, down to the few percent and in single qubits, 0.1%. Uh, and this is just, this is progress of a lot of technology. And this is what I mean by it. We're going from this transition of building, uh, doing sort of these nice demonstrations uh, to building systematic systems. So I'd say the only thing that's similar in these two pictures is the coin, um, but this gives you a perspective uh, for where the processes are today. If you zoom in in our processor, our processors are very much like other people's processors. Um, they consist of 
they consist of uh, qubits. Uh, the qubits are basically still transmons. These are capacitively uh, shunted. So there's a, the pieces of metal here. Uh, to, um, to, um, they form a capacitance. In the middle, there's a junction. The junction forms the Josephson energy, and they're coupled together with uh, microwave resonators. These microwave resonators act as buses that connect one qubit to the other, and then ultimately, there's a readout resonator that comes in and reads it out. So inside these processes is all this technology that basically allows you to lie, lay out and couple them, um, put your qubits in them, and uh, basically design the systems that you've seen. So when I think about how you make progress in the pro uh, processes, I always think of it as a trade space, trading coherence, stability, and uh, con controllability. It's very hard to do all of these together. And, um, and I'll give you a bit of perspective on that. But I, at the, I think of progress as trying to make sure we can continue coherence, continue scalability, and continue controllability. And a lot of these uh, counteract each other one. There might be ways that we can do coherence, um, but uh, that doesn't give us enough controllability to allow us to do the qubits. Or there might be ways that uh, we can scale the system up by, by scaling up there. It puts too much constraints on our controllability. So trying to minimize these three has basically been uh, the challenge for building uh, these systems. So as an example, if you take um, a transmon, you, there's basically two uh, varieties out there. There's the fixed frequency transmon, um, which is uh, the ones that are used by ourselves and Yazoo, Yazoo in uh, Japan. And there's the tunable um, uh, Cooper, uh, flux, the, the tunable, uh, I'll just call it the tunable flux transmon. It has uh, basically two junctions and you can tune a uh, flux through them. So what are some pros and cons? So on the one on the left is very uh, simple, right? It doesn't have any flux noise or any susceptibility to uh, flux, but what that comes at is you basically, once you build a qubit, it has that frequency. The good thing with that is it also has generally higher coherence because it doesn't have that flex uh, susceptibility to flux, but it puts a lot more constraints on how you actually control this system, how you do the gates, because now you can't actually move these qubits into good positions to do the gates. Whereas the one on the right uh, is, is basically the opposite. So you have the ability to move the qubits to different positions, making two and single qubit gates easier, but you've opened yourself up to more flux noise. And this is what I mean by you have this sort of trade space that you have to work with. We, we go with, um, we prefer on the left because it allows us to uh, exploit the coherence. And in seeing that we're seeing continual progress in the field, there's many things that go into this, uh, this graph. Um, from many uh, different groups, understanding packaging, understanding um, like thermalization, design, and the materials. But we're seeing continual progress of increasing our coherence in the work. And I keep looking forward to the day that we reliably uh, cross the milliseconds. We're getting very close, but uh, I see us on a path to getting up to hopefully about 10 milliseconds and then ideas from error correction can come in and we don't need to keep pushing the coherence anymore. As an example in coherence of something that becomes uh, very important for T1, which is the energy loss of the system, it's really understanding where the electric fields live. So our earlier designs of qubits had certain uh, pads that had a lot more, um, I will say features, they had a lot more high energy, um, high, high electric magnetic field components. And in doing that, the participation of the electric field of the qubit lived more in the actual surfaces. By designing the qubit to basically have less of the E field um, in these um, surface participation areas, uh, we saw continuous progress of increasing the quality of the qubits. And we've seen this uh, continue and some, uh, sometimes we're getting up to around the 12 to 15 million Q. This is still a lot of, a lot of material science and a lot of work to do there. And in this type of talk, I'm not gonna uh, go into that. But an interesting thing I would also note to you, everyone 
it's also hard to see the same type of effect in multi qubits, and there are typically a few factors below. And this suggests that as you go to a system where you have to focus more on scalability, you have the you have other effects that are emerging, and there and there's interesting physics that needs to keep be uh, solved to get the same high coherence in those larger uh, systems. So, if you've got a single junction, how do you actually uh, and you can't move the qubits? How do you do the gate? So we exploit this effect known as the cross resonance effect. And the way it works is if you imagine you've got two qubits and the coupling, um, the matrix uh, amplifiers um, basically overlap, right? So, so you get a little bit of one uh, matrix component in the other. And so that's what I have on the top uh, right. I have the, the first qubit has a little bit of the second qubit. And there's a mistake. The second qubit should have a little bit of the first qubit with a negative sign. And so what this means is basically you have a different phase of how much of the other qubit you have in, the, in, uh, in, in how they hybridize in this sort of entangled basis. And that different phase you can exploit because what it means is now I can drive one qubit at the frequency of the other. And because of that sign difference, I can drive it either forward or backwards and do a conditional rotation. And this becomes the way that we do the gate. But this type of effect requires the qubits to be close in frequency. It requires understanding of all the higher levels and it understands uh, strong driving and, and, uh, and any leakage of the classical field into the other qubits. And so this is what I mean by, you've got your high frequency qubits, but now you put all your com uh, complexity in the control. Another, um, another area that sort of highlights this is because you also have this complexity in the control, you get stuck with this question of, well, how can I um, not have too many neighbors because I, I, I might have them coupling to each other. And so you have to come up with different arrangements that minimize uh, what's around and um, what you have that minimizes any uh, potential bad, uh, bad interactions. And so if I'm doing this sort of cross resonance where I have a control qubit, I want to minimize how many target qubits I have so that I know which one I'm exactly driving. And so by doing an architecture, which we call the heavy axe, it has the ability of uh, the control qubit only has two neighbors, whereas the, uh, so that uh, like if I take this three, it has a neighbor one on the left and neighbor uh, two on the three, a uh, neighbor two on the right. It minimizes the amount of effects that can go wrong. And so you might say, why is this important? Well, if you start to now ask the question as I make bigger uh, systems, how many times, how likely is just random fluctuations in the qubit uh, fabrication process going to result in me getting a chip that I cannot use because there will be a neighbor that collides either with a direct transition or collides in a way that I cannot actually do the cross resonance effect. You can actually behind the scenes, you can identify actually it's about eight different uh, types of collision effects that can occur and I'm not going to go into them all here but all of them relate to having basically minimizing the neighbors. And so it turns out that you can come up with different types of arrays that are simpler to build. And what I think is nice about this example is um, you see on the, in the plot here, the actual yield of, the, of getting a successful device increases substantially with uh, the fluctuation parameter, which is how much the qubits are sort of fluctuating in design frequency. And what we see is uh, this is what has allowed us to build 27 and 65 qubits uh, with high uh, 65 qubit processors with relatively high performance. Going forward, we're going to have to actually bring down the fluctuation parameter, the sigma, uh, so that we we can get it we can get the qubits in a much uh, more reliable um, position. But it sort of it, it does highlight this uh, as you will go towards uh, building up larger devices and thinking about scalability. You have to think about the architecture. I'm not going to talk about today, but what's nice about this is now you can ask the question, can I design codes for this type of architecture? And the team um, did this, uh, uh, Chris Chamberlain uh, with Andrew Cross and a few others, determined that there was an equivalent uh, code that can exist on this type of architecture. So the ideas and the directions that we want to go as we go towards uh, studying error correction are also possible in this uh, architecture. So this, if I sort of say what, what was the main thing that made the 27 qubit uh, machine possible, it's one that this optimized lattice. 
The second is developing post um, fab techniques. So as I said on the previous slide, there's a prem that, that sigma parameter is the sort of variation in the qubit frequency. So uh, shown in this paper that we released uh, last year, I believe, um, you can tune the qubits with a laser after, and by tuning the qubits with the laser after, you can go from this pink distribution of frequencies to the black distribution. And so this can show basically a tenfold improvement of getting the qubits at the frequency you want. And this is tackling the question of how do we actually make the variation parameter smaller. And so by putting these two uh, techniques together, we have pretty strong confidence uh, that we uh, will continue uh, scaling these devices up to larger and larger qubits. And obviously we have to keep improving both of them, but it shows that the architecture uh, designs what makes it more possible to build these larger systems. Now, um, when we um, first did the uh, 53 qubit machine, every one of the qubits was read out by one of those resonators that I talked to you about before. Um, to go forward, uh, the ability to read out qubits is the dominant source of uh, components in, in, inside uh, these refrigerators. So what to make the 65 qubit uh, chip possible, is we need to develop, and there's, there's been many examples of this by many research groups, the ability to multiplex the readout. How do we make sure we get many, um, how do we take all the qubits and bring them together and minimize the amount of amplifiers? So in the 65 qubit hummingbird design, it was a multiplexing of an eight to one uh, ratio. And so what that really showed is now we could take, not, rather than having 65 qubits, we can now have order 10 uh, amplifier chains and have the same uh, componentry as what you would have on a smaller system uh, to allow you to actually uh, read out uh, these larger systems. So by um, improving this multiplexing technique and showing that you can do it reliably, and that's what's shown in this graph, each one of these resonators are distinct from the others. So I, can, I know which one uh, will be coupled in a qubit, having high bandwidth amplifiers to go over that full range. Uh, allows me to continue forward in increasing my multiplex ratio and actually la uh, build larger devices. So um, this year, we'll be releasing what we call the Eagle uh, processor, which is 127. And I want to give you a bit of a feel for technology and what is required to go forward. I know most people here are uh, theoretical, but this this sort of gives you a feel, uh, gives you a lot of indications of what we're doing and the challenges and what is actually possible. So if you imagine that you had uh, the previous type of machine, um, your ability to read out all the qubits, you almost get limited uh, by a perimeter problem. If I have a, multi a flip chip, but I can only come into each one of the qubits, imagine you have a drawing problem and you have to draw a, line, a control line into every one of my qubits and I come from, I come from the perimeters. To get around this, you have to actually start building, uh, we call it multi-level uh, wiring. Think of it as building a flip chip, which is shown in this uh, pot. So the qubits would be on the top. Then you have a flip chip. You have to have the ability to stack multiple um, levels. And by doing that, you can now imagine having signals uh, cross. And by having signals cross, you solve the, problem, the perimeter problem. This, uh, to do this, you need things like uh, through silicon vias, which abilities to have the control lines that come in, you need to have this multi-level wiring. And by doing this and showing that this works, and here's an here's a actual experimental uh, cross-section of one of our uh, interposer type chips, um, we have the packaging constraint that will allow us to build the 127, and that's why we're confident, we're working on it and confident it'll come out the ship. For all of you guys um, that work on error correction, I like to point this out that this is starting towards showing that these hypotheses of qubits that are stuck in a two-dimensional lattice is really not uh, as strong as uh, what most people would think. So if there are any ideas that can suggest different types of connectivity, um, by bu building the technology that uh, starts to give you this multi-level wiring, you can envision building many different types of graphs into your qubits. There's obviously a lot of challenges here. I'm talking about a flip chip and control lines, very, very much different to uh, multi-level wiring in a qubit chip. But I think there's a lot of promise for low connected, um, but very um, low, uh, very far distance uh, graphs uh, for realizing different types of lattices. 
And so I think that I think there's a lot of exciting research that I would love to see from this community suggesting different types of graphs that we can build. So that type of packaging allows us to basically see a path going forward to larger and larger systems in the qubit. Now you get stuck with a new type of problem that comes around. And that's how do I get enough signals into the fridge and enough signals out? And so this is what we're designing for what we call our Osprey, which is the about 400 qubit machine. Here you, you have the challenge of basically um, the all these fancy pictures that I see everywhere of quantum processes, which are not really quantum processes of these microwave lines, um, just would be ridiculous. So you have to have a much more condensed way of getting the signals in and out. So you need um, a lot more better cryo infrastructure. And in particular shown in this photo is what we call a cryo flex cable. And it's got about a 10 times uh, density improvement of getting the signals in and out. And so this replaces all these microwave uh, uh, lines on the side and can allow us to get a lot more density into our system and basically allow us to put bigger and bigger chips in a single fridge. Going beyond, and uh, as many have seen, we, we, we announced that we wanted to go to 1,000. Um, I would argue that the most important thing for that is uh, better and better two qubit gates. Uh, I want to get 10 to the negative 4, and we need to come up with um, better gates that reduce some of the crosstalk. Shown in this little insert is a uh, novel idea of replacing the bus with a coupler that can have interference uh, components, and by those interference components, it can reduce unwanted crosstalk. And the team got down to 10, uh, 10 to the about two, two by 10 to the negative three error rates with this. Going uh, even beyond that, I think there's a lot, lot there. I, I just listed things, um, but I, I, I think things like uh, building smaller qubits, because if you were to imagine a thousand qubit chip, going building a much larger uh, processor is not going to happen. So you either need to reduce the footprint in the processor, or you need to come up way, with ways of connecting the processors together. Uh, building bigger and bigger cryogenic components is definitely going to be needed. Uh, we like to call the one that we're working on the super fridge because it's pretty big. And I think also building motherboards so you can take this componentry of amplifiers and things and start integrating them uh, to make them a smaller footprint. So an example of one of, uh, one of them is the super fridge uh, type thing. Um, this, uh, this has 10 times the cooling power uh, than, than regular ones and uh, a human can fit inside it. So our plan is basically in the 2023 timeline to see that we can actually cool a system down and show that it's possible to build really large fridges and actually um, so, um, put bigger and bigger systems in. So gates. Um, for me, I think we all need to realize we need to keep pushing gates. Uh, we, we, I talked a bit about this uh, um, cross resonance uh, uh, coupling uh, cancellation type gate that allowed to get, there are other ways of bringing flux back in, but not putting flux onto the actual qubits by putting it into the couplers. And the teams have uh, recently shown that they can do that and get relative, uh, get uh, fast gates with low error rates as well, around uh, just below, uh, around the one by 10 to the negative three. And also um, I, I think I think it's important to keep thinking about alternative gates that can exploit different types of properties. And so by continued pushing and thinking about novel types of two qubit gates is what is definitely needed uh, to keep pushing and working out what we want for the next type of gate. Okay, so as I said at the start, it's also systems are more than a processor. Um, I just throw this up quickly to sort of show you that a lot has to go into actually making uh, a system work. On the first is the gen what we call generation electronics, and it's basically just a simple rack that controls 20 qubits. Um, generation two, um, everything on the left can fit in the right. And so you see that basically you've shrunken it and this can uh, get us around the 84 qubits and a couple of them around the, so a few, just getting over 100. And then generation three, basically you take everything in the middle and you can fit it inside a pizza box. And this uh, shows continual improvement of scaling, shrinking the electronics to allow us to control larger and larger big uh, systems. And another important thing is uh, in bringing in the ability to do um, classical computations uh, in real time. 
So as a simple example, what's shown here is if, if you imagine you wanted to uh, insert a reset. So I wanted to put at the middle of a circuit the ability for it to be put into a zero state. Um, this requires now doing some logic in the coherent, like it requires reading out the signal. So you need a fast readout, which means you need to have fast readout coupled to your qubits that do, do not uh, degrade its quality. You need to have fast classical processing to do the integration, and you need to have fast uh, reset uh, cycle times to make sure that you can do make a decision uh, before the coherence of the qubits uh, have, have disappeared. And so um, what, what we do as an example here, we've rolled this out to all of our systems that are online, is um, basically uh, show that you um, can basically apply the reset time multiple times and see an improved uh, fidelity by in reset, reset, and then measure. Uh, and uh, what's shown here is uh, for one, one reset in the purple, two resets, three resets, four resets. And it's, it's, it's a, just a nice indication that um, we, we're starting to get this uh, classical logic into our circuits, and I like to call this uh, dynamic circuits. So as, we, as I said, this roadmap I, I released last year, uh, this is what we see as going forward. I wanted to sort of just say a little bit to get to the million qubits and beyond, we're going to have to work out how to modulize it and how to go from uh, chip to chip and build uh, interconnects. And I think this is an exciting area that really isn't answered. Some initial work that we've started is just thinking about how you can couple uh, just dilution refrigerators uh, to each of them by exploiting uh, silicon uh, uh, optical resonators. I would argue that there's a lot of uh, ideas that need to be worked out to determine the best way that we can build chip to chip uh, couplings and quantum interconnects uh, is one of the biggest challenges that we have to solve uh, coming up. Okay, so just to change a little bit of a direction. So um, if you build something, how do you actually measure its quality? And this is something that um, I, I, I've been struggling with for a long time and uh, I thought I'd give you a bit of my views on it and some of the challenges that we're doing. So lots of, when you, when you have an experiment, there are things that you can get from the actual experiment, right? You can come up with a way that you can measure it. Like you can ask it, what is its coherence time? T1, T2. What is the coupling between qubits? What is, uh, what is the uh, coupling between a qubit and a resonator or, the, or, or, or a different type of coupling between qubits? What is the readout uh, loss rate? What is the readout SNR? I, I like to call all these device metrics. We have very good ways of measuring them and become very reliable and automating of them. But they, um, they tell us something about the device. Then, then if you go one step up, you start to now bring in something about the user and how they calibrated it, how they did or how they did some subsystem component of it. And um, we, we as a field have come up, in my opinion, with lots of good techniques like tomography, randomized benchmarking, uh, a matrix for those that don't know, just think of this as the readout crosstalk uh, matrix, ways of determining whether the errors are um, coherent or whether there's leakage. But these don't, these still don't tell you about the full system, but they give you a feel for what's going when you bring in your control, what is going on uh, in, in the subspace and gives you an estimate for the overall performance. And then there are things um, that are holistic. Uh, quantum volume would be one. I, I would argue graph states are another. Uh, N-bit random Cliffords uh, would be another. And these start to tell you about how, um, how, how the system is performing on whole. And so I like to say the lower layers, well, we like to say the lower layers have predictive power, but they don't tell us everything. And we, they, we from them, we can predict how the qubit and error rates would go. Um, but as we go up, it, it doesn't reveal every type of error. And so this is why it's important to come up with metrics that are more holistic in nature, because you want to include everything that's uh, going on in the processor. And as an example, you can ask a simple question, and this is one that we do all the time because it's one of the largest areas we have to deal with, is 
unwanted coherent interactions with other qubits. You can ask an example, can I determine what qubit is coupled to other qubits and, and we call it a ZZ interaction. You can come up with a pulse sequence here, we call it jazz, but the details of it doesn't really matter. It's just a way of determining how, thing, how other qubits are coupling so I can measure reliably a Hamiltonian component, in this case, the ZZ component. And uh, so we can do a measurement and we can look through and we can quickly scan and see in this example, the ones that are highlighted slightly yellow have much um, higher uh, um, error rates uh, that, well, would, would be ones that we'd be concerned about. Sorry, I said that the wrong way. Would be ones that are low, whereas the other ones are, are, are higher and, and some of them uh, can be up, up, to, up into the 300 sort of kilohertz range. And so you get a feel for from this how the device is going to perform, but it is not everything. And so I like to say these are device metrics that sort of tell you, allow you to predict the performance of it. The next is you start to say, well, now I want to tune up a two qubit gate. Well, so what we found early on is we had a lot of uh, cr classical crosstalk, so signals uh, going from one control line to the other. So you have to come up with a nice effective calibration routine and then benchmark and determine that that uh, can, can get you the result you want. Then, um, then you find, well, I start doing multi-qubit experiments. In this example, we, we started to look at demonstrating a fault tolerant uh, five qubit uh, device. And you find that the spectator errors become uh, a real problem. And so rather than um, try and tune them away in the gate, uh, you take your pulse and start dy uh, dynamical decoupling. So we, we took our standard pulse and split it into four and then put uh, decoupling sequences on the spectator qubit. This is, uh, this is one approach, but it makes the circuits very, very long. And so then you can say, well, what is there ways that I can actually come up with um, dynamics I can apply in the qubit? And so th this case, rotary echo, uh, is an example where I drive my target qubit really, really strongly so that I cause it to decouple um, from its neighbors, but I drive it in a way that commutes with the gate so that I don't have to, um, I don't have to worry about um, any type of effect. Uh, I, I can ca still calibrate my gate in its subspace. And now I can um, basically cause the target uh, to not be coupled to any of its neighbors. And so these, this sort of shows the next step is it, you, you then can determine your way in which you actually calibrate a system. And by better understanding those input parameters, you can derive different types of pulse sequences that give you a better two qubit gate. But then you come to the next is now you ask yourself, how does it perform overall? Now, reason why I like the quantum volume is not because it's a strong definition of anything, but I think of it as a weak definition of the computational space that you have access with your machine. I, I don't think I'm ever going to convince certain people whether or not you take the two to the power of it or not, but you can come up with some metric of it that represents how it's uh, how that's performing. And what this takes into account is the the error rates that we talked about, so the low fidelity two qubit, the low um, the low single qubit, as well as the coherence, but it also takes into account the connectivity, how much crosstalk is going on, how much gates can be done in parallel. So in this, in this example, because I'm doing something on the spectator, I couldn't do two gates in parallel with this control sequence, whereas this one, which gets rid of the spectator error, I could do them in parallel. So, it's, so by your choice of how you do it determines how much parallelization can be done and ultimately how stable your electronics. And so Whilst it loses some technical definition, this is what I mean by it becomes a holistic measure that gives you an overall performance. And as an example, um, so the quantum volume for people that don't know it, think of it as just playing random two qubit unitaries um, and playing them and seeing how many you can do. Um, when, when we first, um, first uh, started to see about pushing this, um, it opened up different interesting questions. So how did, you, how did we make the next step in improving the volume of our system? Well, the first one was um, just actually coming up with a better co compiler. If you know your gates have a certain preferred direction, you should compile to that direction. Seems like an obvious statement, but when you actually are having a circuit, 
exploiting the way the hardware does the gates more efficiently, uh, you should do. And so either compiling it to the direction of the C knots or inserting gates inside the middle that minimize depending on the architecture of phase gates are easier to do than uh, pi on two gates, I should do more phase gates. Second is, and this one is interesting as well, is um, it may turn out to do a less fidelity two qubit gate to have better performance in the full Hilbert space than in the subspace. And so by doing a faster gate that was harder to get uh, to, to as high a fidelity. So we took, uh, we, we did the same rotary echo, but we did it in a shorter time by not echoing within its own subspace. You take a bit of hit in its own subspace, but you can do it faster, um, but you can um, now implement uh, more of these in the coherence. And so you can on an average get a better holistic uh, 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 response. Third is working out how you continually insert into um, a circuit when you should actually decouple the noise, so putting dynamical decoupling. And, third, and the fourth was um, taking into account, can I actually read out higher levels of a system to use to get better SNR on my system? And so this, this, uh, this, allows, you to, um, this allows you to get a better SNR. And so we basically promoted the one state to the F state before reading out. Um, allows it to, to get better ability to say, was it zero or one? And so all these made a small um, bit of improvement, but it sort of shows that it's, it's a holistic in nature that really starts to get at the question of trying to identify how subsystems interact and how to best put all the pieces together. Continuing it further to get to 128 is, is, is taking it in and asking even more questions about how you do circuits uh, that take into account the hardware even better. So are there ways that you can basically uh, minimize, uh, take advantage of future gates to minimize it and you can get small improvements by improving the compiler better, as well as putting more complicated um, processing uh, techniques into the readout. Do I do a readout with a linear discriminator or a quadratic discriminator? And so you see that you can continue uh, pulling on different parts of it on a holistic way. And this is what we've seen to continue uh, increasing the volume. I like, to, I like this uh, uh, quote by someone in, that, that I work with, Peter. If we ever need to explain our quantum volume, I actually do like to think of it as uh, uh, two, uh, two, two of these dinosaurs are uh, butting heads. Um, and so it just shows that you can, it's about continuing to work on your system and remove all these imperfections so the overall performance of the system uh, continues to get better. And doing this is what we've done to see that we've continued seeing improvements of the quantum volume. Now, I think there's an interesting point that's going to happen and that's, that I hope I'm predicting in the 2023 that we'll start to actually get error correction and start to look at different types of things in there. And I think there's a lot of science to do that. But um, for now, um, I look at it as a way of us tracking for the near future how the system performances continue to improve. OK. So just to go quickly on a different tack. So in 2016, um, we, we, we put um, this, as Barbara said, we put this machine online. And to me, this, this sort of showed a need for science to be uh, done, done on these machines. And since then, I think we've seen um, the growing adoption. So at the moment, uh, we get somewhere around 2 billion circuits run a day. That just shows how many different circuits uh, are running. And we see this uh, continually to grow and become uh, useful for people. Um, but we knew we needed to work out how you program it. And this is why I wanted to take a different sort of little bit of a different spin and talk about how we need to build the software to allow us to do the science uh, on top of these machines to build the full system. So for instance, the circuit becomes uh, a lot more powerful. It needs to do a lot of different things. Some of them are insert these pulses so that people could explore different ways of actually being able to um, come up with uh, like that direct C knot that we used in the C knot, try different types of sequences to do the same gate. Timing matters 
uh, to some some applications. If I need to do a CNOT at a certain time or I want to dynamically decouple, timing needs to be built into the actual circuits uh, to give you the ability to explore different things. Uh, if I'm doing things like random Cliffords or, or quantum volume, I need the abstraction to different types of operators so I can easily build more complicated circuits and work on the compilers to work out how I can turn them into different types of gates. I need the ability, if I'm exploring some applications, uh, to do uh, like classical oracles, and I need the ability to exploit other circuits and embed them into them. And so we've continued to work on making sure that we do this completely in the open, but get a framework where this can be done. Uh, on top of that, you start to do some interesting things. You can start to ask, and, and this is where I've seen a lot of cool things by different uh, researchers, you can ask, well, can I come up with better ways of synthesizing the algorithms for what people are interested in the applications? But in, in going down lower, can I choose different types of basis gates to explore how I want to do it and working out different types of passes? Uh, timing, uh, can I do things like make all my CNOTs occur left justified, right justified, uh, center justified? All these can make different things, uh, different things possible. So we need the, the ability to do all of this uh, to, to basically let us to continue to understand what's going on in these systems. Uh, template compiling is what is one of the things that we started to ex, uh, exploit to make uh, make more efficient circuits for the quantum volume and also what you see down the bottom choosing hardware aware layouts can come up with different ways of taking some type of random task and determining how it can uh, run on our hardware. So all of these seem to uh, seem to suggest there's a lot of innovation to get coming on building what would be uh, a compiler going forward. Okay, so now I wanted to go a slightly different way. So if we've got circuits, how are we going to use circuits? So the way I view on circuits is you've got to think of circuits and also the classical uh, programming that goes around in it. And this has allowed us to start to think slightly a bit more differently. So this is obvious to everyone here, but I think uh, if you've got some type of problem, you need to write it as some type of quantum circuits that run on your system, plus some classical computing that gets done. Not going to go into the details, but I'm sure you've heard in this conference about things like variational algorithm. You'll have the ability of taking some type of quantum circuit, running it on some type of hardware, and investigating some type of problem, and continuing to do this integration being between classical and quantum. You can continue to, as we've demonstrated, you can map out chemistry and things like that. But you can also do extra things. You can say, well, can I add different types of circuits together to get better accuracy of a problem? And we, we called this error mitigation because we wanted to differentiate it from, from error correction. But it's a sense of classical processing of many quantum circuits to give me a better answer to some type of problem. So it's suggesting that by running multiple of these is, is an important thing to do. And one way you can do it is to obviously have the circuitry to allow you to double the errors. You can double that by doubling the times of the pulses. And we were able to take this and show that we could improve the chemistry result before. Another, which I think Sarah talked to you about before uh, yesterday, is if I've got a hard circuit, can I break it up into multiple circuits and then do classical processing of these circuits together to get a better answer? And so what this is suggesting, now I have my circuit, I want to run multiple of them, but I now need the ability to join them all together in different ways uh, to get my answer to be able to run it. And by doing this, you can then map out some type of problem. And I, I, I'm just using all of this to set up that I think the future needs to be ability for us to be able to connect classical and quantum together. And so we ask the question of how are we going to do that? Now, a trivial answer is you say it's classical and quantum together. Um, I would argue Shaw's algorithm is classical and quantum together. So this is not really enough details to do anything useful. Instead, you can start to realize there's two time scales that actually matter. There's the time scale to process many of these circuits to do some of the things I just really fastly flick, flick through. Uh, we like to call these near time. These are 
how do you bring classical resources to post-process uh, circuits, add them together in ways to do more complicated things? And then there's real time is how do you do things within the coherence, like the measurement reset I said at the start, to do some classical task that enhances the quantum circuit? And, uh, and that, that I would call real time. To allow real time, as I said, we, we continue to build our electronics and de design our electronics to do simple calculations uh, between them. And we've just released a, um, a, a chasm language that we call Open Chasm 3, an update of it, to really give you the power, for instance, uh, you can take a classical bit and insert it and do the fa uh, phase update uh, to do, uh, to do a, a conditional gate. And so what this suggests is we really need to know what classical commands we need to build into the electronics, because we can't do all of them, that are important to do in the very fast time scale. And so by understanding that um, from the field, I think is very important to drive the technology forward. And it's only going to be a limited but a uh, an important set of operations. Obviously, error correction is, is, one, is one of them and doing simple um, parity checks and, and, and processing that for. As an example of one that we, we just took was phase estimation. For all of you guys know, you know phase estimation, you can do it uh, with the Kataev measurement uh, process, which uh, basically has independent circuits that you post-process many times and you can add them together to give an answer, or you can do it with a uh, iterative process, which you feed forward the previous results to future results, and you continue this uh, feed forward by updating the final one based on all the results before. And this opens a, like both of these are equivalent, um, but that opens up an interesting trade space that you can start to explore uh, experimentally. When is it better to do things in real time versus uh, uh, post-processing? And in, in an experiment, uh, non-surprisingly, non we found that for limited number of resources, which in this case are measurements, uh, you can get uh, advantages by doing the dynamic circuit. But uh, as, as time goes, as the resources increase and these circuits get longer, the coherence starts to come in and limit uh, some of the effects on this. But all I'm just sort of giving this is to say is we need to determine which things need to be built into a real time and what, what type of circuits need to exploit those real times. And then for near time, if you were to reproduce um, the chemistry results uh, that we did um, a few years ago, it would actually take you 100 days on our current uh, cloud architecture. And the reason for this is an architectural design. And so to make progress going forward, we have to introduce this concept of a runtime. Otherwise, I do not think uh, people will be able to do the next set of experiments of determining uh, um, what, 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 like determining how applications work on real hardware, to be honest. And so the, what the runtime is, is, the, is borrowing from uh, graphics cards. How do you set up a programming environment where a user can get the quantum and, and classical and go as fast as possible? As an example, uh, we've already um, um, prototyped it with a, uh, with a simulator and we're gonna release it this year. Um, on the right is, is how you do it the new way. You would actually upload your problem you would run your problem and you can get your results. And here it's just taking that chemistry example and it shows that uh, you can get your results in a few seconds. On the left is how we do it uh, the cur currently today and why um, honestly uh, it's very hard to reproduce some of the results uh, with uh, by the cloud is because it's just too slow and noise and drift will come in. So I think the runtime and develop and understanding that classical quantum combination and what classical uh, uh, calculations need to be done in real time and which ones need to be done in uh, um, near time are important for uh, driving this technology forward. This is just an example uh, how you would replace it. So as, as I think about it, I think what's still important for us in a technology is uh, to understand circuits and uh, what I'm very interested in is continually understanding how we increase the quality of the circuits. Um, I think the driving the quality is going to be driven a lot by, um, by continual improvements of just the raw physics, but also starting to inject over, over time different ideas from error correction and things like this. 
The capaci capacity is how well you can integrate your actual circuits with classical hardware. It's exciting to me that we're at a time in the field where we need to be starting to think about this because we want to be able to get the most out of our quantum systems and we need to be able to be leveraging all the ideas that people have done in HPC of bringing and setting up proper programming uh, environments to allow you to get full capacity out of your system. And then the third is variety. That I think it's important that the theoretical world keeps driving which circuits matter, as well as an understanding if we can classically through real time boost what can be done, i.e. can I exploit teleportation or can I exploit iterative phase estimation to do something better? Um, when and how should I do that um, determines um, what we can do and which circuits can be run. So I like to take these three things as uh, how we how we continue driving quantum forward. I'm not going to I'm just going to end on this and say a couple of words. Um, error mitigation to me um, was a way of envisioning how we could take noisy systems and get a bit more out of them. I think that I think the path to um, building what we all want to build a quantum error corrected fault tolerant machine. Uh, is not through something of wait until we get a logical qubit and then start putting logical qubits together. But can we think of it more as how do we build larger systems and drive higher quality circuits and boost what those circuits can do through classical calculations, i.e. error mitigation? And is it possible to make a transition from error mitigation uh, to error correction by building a lot of these ideas of, uh, of uh, fault tolerant error correction into error mitigation. And I, I want to end on that to say that I think this path is a path that can allow us to keep thinking of novel ways that we can speed up the transition to get to where we all want to get to, which is uh, fault tolerant quantum computing. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Jay, for a very nice talk, a really grand tour of uh, grand vision of the future, perhaps, and uh, what IBM is doing in the future. Um, there are a few questions on Slack. I have a few questions. So uh, let me state a question here by uh, Raul Garcia Patron, which came up uh, pretty early in your talk about when you talked about multiplexing. And he was interested in knowing how multiplexing affects crosstalk and correlated errors. Can this impact full tolerance? A quantum error correction. So can you say something about that? Um, so yes, it will. And we need to understand better techniques of addressing what crosstalk is important. It's in if if we can make the resonators decoupled enough that the sig like there's a lot of bandwidth in amplifiers and the cavities have low bandwidth. There are a lot of smart ways classically of putting signals through that can make sure that they don't uh, move into the other one. And so I think if you just do the, the, the simple way of having a harmonic oscillator that rings with different frequencies and then you integrate the signal without filtering it, um, you're going to introduce some crosstalk into your system. But if we can come up with better filters that go into to integrate that allow us to separate it because that class that crosstalk is essentially only classical it's a post-processing crosstalk um then um then i think it will be fine but i, I high level i agree and that is un understanding but the future has to be multiplexing because you are not going to have a readout per qubit and it has to be multiplexed at some point either in the fridge or outside or when it's digitized and so um, working out where that is and how we continue to improve and work out better metrics for understanding how much crosstalk we can t tolerate, I think are great questions. Um, let me ask a different question, uh, maybe related to error correction. Um, you know, I haven't heard you say the word leakage very much. I mean, you talked about this um, distinguishing, you know, getting better readout um, signal and so on, but uh, this is of course an issue also with error correction. So what are your thoughts on it and yeah. 
I, I agree, we don't do enough <laughs> is my thoughts. Um, I would love to see more ideas of thinking of leakage reduction units, whether we use other qubits or exploit other levels or even build analog leakage reduction units into our system. I think there are ways that you could imagine making it such that if you leaked, you naturally decohere more. Um, the, these are all open questions, Barbara, and I have the same opinion as you as leakage and error correction has not been thought about enough. Okay, let me ask another question from the audience. Uh, Yunan Lin asks, I'm a bit lost about the Qiskit runtime slide. What exactly enabled the runtime improvement? So for, for the physics community, it would be hard to see. For the, for, for, you, for the development community, if you're going to offer jobs through the cloud and you're going to do it, you need it to be secure. You need to have sure that each job doesn't connect and you need to um, basically um, manage different types of containers. So there's a lot of work in the development world of um, this monetization of uh, containers and uh, things like this. So we are moving and exploiting all this work of how you do all this new technology of containers and how those containers say built with OpenShift, which is the uh, one of IBM's versions of it, um, can, can allow you to set up an environment where you can imagine being just there in the lab. And so, it's, it's, it's innovation, but it's not innovation through this, the, through the, um, through the lens of the physics is innovation through the lens of um, how you take advantage of new technology, development technology and things like that. And by doing that, we can now really ask the question of how do I put you like you are truly in the lab and you have control and you can get the, the capacity, the natural capacity of the system can like the system, the rep rate of the system is, is much, much faster than the rep rate that you can do through the cloud. So I hope that answers your question. I think it's great technology. It's just not technology that we as we, when we look through our physics eyes, we gen, we generally understand. Um, one thing, maybe I can ask another question. You mentioned at the beginning of your talk, you know, we need a factor of 10 sort of an order of magnitude for error correction. So, um, so where are you going to get this? Is this the, the two qubit gate? Uh, is it other? I mean, you're, you're not thinking about using 3D cavities, I assume, or other materials, or is there other more exploratory projects that are going on at IBM that uh, strive towards that or? Well, the three gates that I meant, so we are not limited yet in the gates on the coherence of our systems. So the three gates that I mentioned are three different directions we are pursuing uh, to get what I like to call coherence limited. In parallel, it's about continually to push coherence, understanding designs, structures, cleans, processing uh, that will continue to drive improvements in the raw coherence. This is why I think it's extremely important that we learn to separate device metrics system metrics and holistic metrics. Device metrics tell me how I'm making the physics of my system better. They are things like raw coherence, crosstalk, the ZZ, the, like just the natural Hamiltonian of my system, the natural SNR of my amplifiers, the natural, um, the natural um, classical crosstalk. If I put power on one line, how much does it go over to another line through package modes and things like this. These are very important that we continue to understand and drive better uh, device metrics. Then on top of that, you put in a bit of human input, like I've got this device, it's got this Hamiltonian, I've got this procedure, how do I actually um, tune it up? And that's why I like to call them uh, subsystem metrics. And the gate errors, they're all important. Uh, correlated benchmarking, sort of how much, how, what weight pulleys are effectively on your system. And then, and then you need the holistic me metrics that don't tell you, like you lose a little bit of detail of every processor, but you can ask larger, larger things. And so to answer your question, I think there's improvements in both the device metrics and the system metrics, and I want to see them revealed in the um, holistic metrics. 
Okay, thanks. Um, well, thanks for answering our questions so far. So I see there are some more questions, but I think we should uh, stop now and move to the next talk soon. So Jay will be available at the round table if you want to ask him uh, these questions directly. Okay, so thanks Jay. And so if you can stop share the screen. Um,